Welcome, I'm Darren, and I'll be your guide today as I look at the FLIR Ultra basketball sets for 94.95 and 95.96. Now, Ultra was a, a really high mark for, for FLIR in, in the early 90s. Their first set wasn't very good, but then the, they followed it up with two great sets. And in basketball, they were able to utilize these sets to really kind of reclaim their claim to fame of owning the, the basketball market from Upper Deck. They were able to compete head to head and in many ways kind of have an advantage over Upper Deck. Upper Deck was going to be doing some scrambling in 93, 94 to try to, to regain. And in 94, 95, they were finally gonna be able to make a push forward with their SP cards. But Flair had clearly taken the reins in terms of the high-end card market, just in terms of how well these cards had been coming out, in not only in their main Ultra set, but also in the inserts that they were doing. So they were on a high, high mark. And for 94.95, it was an opportunity for them to kind of refine it and really get it to, to a level that was more, uh, more built toward the, the adult market, the, the market of collectors who are looking for the really high-end card, as opposed to just kids collecting cards. Now, pretty much everybody did this in 94, 95. 94 in, in football, in baseball, in basketball, in hockey, basically all the cards were done in a very similar fashion and this was no different. It was really interesting how it was almost like everybody just automatically agreed to get rid of the borders. And with Ultra, they were already most of the way there because the cards were basically a little border at the bottom and then it was a three quarter bleed. So they were, they were close, they knew what they were doing, but to go full borderless, this was, a, this was a step that was going to be a little bit much for them. Not that they realized it. They thought that they had a handle on it and it, it kind of fell short. With the basketball set specifically, they actually went with a full bleed, no border at all. All they had were two little elements in gold and silver foil. They had the logo in gold foil and then they had the name in silver foil. But they were kind of floating in space and so the, the card had to entirely read based upon the images. The images tended to be pretty well selected, but they, they were a little bit too dark, and so they kind of got lost. It, it's difficult with basketball because if you have a bright image, it tends to be congested. If you have a dark image, then it's, it's usually a better silhouette, but the card gets kind of, kind of heavy. And in this case, because of the foil on the side, when it was a really dark card, the foil was kind of overpowering. And the foil is kind of tricky because when the light shines on it, then it's really bright. And when the light doesn't shine on it, you can't even see it. So this was, this was a, an attempt that they made that really did fall flat. On the card back, they, they again tried something really interesting. These are very well designed cards in terms of just the concept. What's done on paper is really, really good. They're well crafted. The problem is it didn't work on the card back. They had a little text box for the stats and some basic little vitals, very small space. And then above that, they had gold foil with the player name and the logo for the team. And then they just had this big field for really showcasing three images, but because it was three images, they all kind of competed and nothing was very clear on the card back. So it was a great opportunity. It, it was basically a canvas where they forgot to do anything of substance. This is kind of the problem that Ultra had this year. It really, it, it, they tried too hard and they forgot to get far enough. Now, I do like the fact that every team has kind of like a, a hue of their color on the card back. That's kind of the only, only compliment that I have for the set. Otherwise, fall short. They also didn't do any subsets. Now, they did do some rookies in the first series and then all the rookies in the second series. So a couple of players show up early and then they get repeated. In the first series, they're all in their college uniforms, but they don't have the, the rights. So they're all airbrushed, which just makes it look really cheap. And then also because there are no border elements, the cards don't even read well in pages. So as you go through the cards, they just they're, there's nothing that really ties them together. The only thing of a positive from this set is the checklist. So once again, they did checklists that were a, a player on the front as well as on the back. This is the same image as they used on the front of the card. So the five checklists are Sherman Douglas, Rodney Rogers, Alan Houston, Lorenzo Williams, and Cedric Sabalos. But this was mid 90s FLIR, and so that meant it was all about the inserts, and they had a ton of inserts. Not just the fact that they had a bun bunch of inserts, but they were doing two series, which meant they had the ability to really pack inserts in in the first series as well as in the second series. And they were kind of all over the map in this. This was where they were really at their, their Photoshop height, where they were just playing around with stuff, so it is a really crazy collection of, of designs they came up with. First off, they have the All-NBA, and the All-NBA set is horizontal. These are the first three teams, so first team, second team, third team, 15 cards, 
And the, the problem with these cards is that they, they came up with some crazy ideas that I guess looked good on their computer screen, but when they actually created it, the player doesn't really stand out very well. The card seems kind of busy. And when you put these cards next to each other, the trick in the background kind of overpowers and so you can't really see anything. So it kind of fell short. They also did an all-rookie team, and this was first and second team, so this is 10 cards. These cards are pretty tough to get. They have an angled block on the side of silver foil, and it's embossed through. So the, the text on the card front is actually embossed through the foil instead of being printed. And it, it's, it's an interesting idea that they did. The card actually doesn't look that bad. It has a big three-quarter bleed otherwise, but it, it kind of focuses it really well, and because of the foil being embossed, that means it's always kind of lit at some point. So it works pretty decently. On the card back, the silver foil is replaced by gold, not a foil, but a gold print. And you may find it listed sometimes as these are gold foil. They're, they're not gold foil, they are silver foil. If they're, they ever made gold foil cards, I've, I've never encountered any. I've never heard that anybody's encountered them, so, so understand these are silver foil cards. Now they also did an all-rookie set, and the all-rookie set is a much better design. So here we have, basically it's a border of wood, and then it has the text for the, the player name in the same color as, as the player's team. So it works really good in a combination. And because of the strong border element with the wood on, if you put these in pages, they actually read pretty well as a set, so that's good. The color, the different colors don't really distract from that, so this, I really like how these cards came out. They're very professional, and the card back is very simple, very straightforward, so this was a big plus for, for Ultra here in 94-95. Then they have award winners, and this is a really terrible card. I mean, this is really terrible. A little horizontal card. They have way too much going on, so nothing stands out. Fortunately, it's only four cards, but this is one of those sets that you only collect because it's one of the insert sets. It shows up in the packs, so you kind of check this box off. Fortunately, Defensive Gems, the next set, is a whole lot better. This is a card where they use brushed metal. They, they used little facets, and the whole concept is Defensive Gems, so they used facets. It's a, it's a nice, nice pairing that they did. And the whole card has kind of a liveliness because of how these little patches of light or dark appear and disappear as you look, move the card around. You can't really see the player too well. The, the whole background is too dominant and the colors run together, of course, from the jersey to the rest of the card. But it doesn't matter because the, this is a really cool card and it's all about being a cool card. So it's very successful in that way. Unfortunately, Double Trouble is another, another major setback. This is a full bleed card. It has two images with kind of a, a slash between the two, but it's not a, a clear slash. It's just that the pictures kind of run into each other. And that's the problem. It has two images of the player and they, they both kind of fight each other to complement to the point where you can't really see anything on the card. And it also doesn't help that they use silver text down at the bottom, which kind of just, it just kind of disappears. The inside outside set is a lot better. This is, I don't think it's a really good card design, but the way it came together is really good. They have a, a silver background and then they have a really good shot of the player. And then they have another picture that's, it, it's kind of like it's been slashed into a bunch of panels. They kind of, kind of arrayed around. It's a weird, a weird array, but it looks really professional, really straightforward, really nice. So this is a good card. And it kind of shows that it, it's interesting where they were just trying a bunch of different things. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. You kind of wish that they had done this a little bit earlier to figure out which ones were going to work and just focus on those. But it, it was fascinating going through all of the inserts here and finding all of these different designs that were coming up at, at various rates and putting together the sets and kind of seeing how they all worked. Then they have Jam City, and Jam City is a really neat card. It has some really bright colors, it has some interesting graphics. The only problem is, we're gonna play Where's Waldo? And the question is, can you see the player? I can't. He completely gets buried inside this, this very exciting card. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I love the card, I love how powerful the card is. I'm not sure if I'm disappointed by the fact that the player kind of disappears, but that's kind of how this card works. On the card back, you can clearly see him because he's front and center, he's right in the middle. But otherwise, this is a card that is way too powerful for what it's supposed to do. Now the Ultra Power cards, on the other hand, they also are very dominant, but the whole thing is like an explosion of color from behind the player, showcasing the player. And they have gold glitter that's, that's embedded into it, so the card has a lot of liveliness, 
and it works really well in combination with the image of the player so even if the image itself isn't all that strong the card does a really good job of showcasing it so i love these cards now power in the key continues the seesaw pattern that we've been going through of good set bad set good set bad set here it's just it, it's kind of a mess and and that's about all there is to say about it now we're going to follow that up by breaking tradition and we're going to go with another negative set now i don't know if this is a bad set or not rebound kings is is a card set that has always baffled me for all these years because i i always forget about it i always forget i run into this card set and i go wait have i collected that i could look at it three minutes later and go yeah i don't have i what about that one have i have i collected that there's nothing distinctive about it absolutely nothing is memorable about this card it looks more like a back of a card rather than the car the front of a card so it's a weird one that they went with. I don't think it worked, but I, I actually can't say whether I dislike it because I can't make a decision one way or the other. Fortunately, we're going to end well, and that's with Scoring Kings. This is like Mardi Gras. In this case, they have some different color foils and they have some metal etching that combines together to make a really interesting card. And the etching doesn't necessarily align with the foil. So there's actually some interplay that goes on. The card design itself isn't great, but it is a lot of fun of a card and it, it looks kind of cool. Now, 9495 didn't really work. They Everybody thought that they knew what they were doing. They thought they had the answer and then pretty much everybody realized that no, they didn't. They really didn't. So 95, 96 was a year where a lot of innovation was, was taking place where people had to really sit down and figure out the answer, solve these problems. And with Ultra, they, they knew to use, they had all the pieces they needed, but they needed to refine it. So they, they did a, again, a full bleed card. This time they made a little plaque down at the bottom, a gold foil plaque that had a little bit of design work in it, but that was where all the information came from. So it was very clear, very central, it was it acts like a border by having that central component to the card that everything else kind of relates to it's just strong enough that stands out but not strong enough to overpower it they got it right and then they changed the logo to be more almost like a silhouette in a way it's it's a very minor little contribution to the card and so the the images on the card are able to read a lot better the set did work a lot better it's not great but it is a big improvement the card backs are, they're, they're okay. They, they kind of played around with some stuff, but it's, it's fairly decent. But they did do something distinctive where all of the East Coast teams have kind of a rose hue. And then all the West Coast teams have kind of a lavender hue. So that's kind of a difference that you're going to see in the card backs. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same across the whole board. It's, it's pretty decent. But for 95-96, they decided that they were going to do parallels and specifically for Series 1, not for Series 2, but for Series 1. Now, the parallel that they went with was they took away all of the background and they replaced it with solid gold foil. I mean, solid gold foil. It is super overpowering. And then they put, they stamped a big logo for gold medallion, which is the theme of the parallel. They stamped it right in so it's fully embossed. You see it on the front and you can see it on the back. Whether these really worked or not is, I don't really know because all you're doing with parallels is you're just trying to pull them out of the packs as you're going. And so it's fun to be able to put together the set. These are not parallels to look at. These are really not parallels to look at, but they do make the set a lot more interesting. And they did get used in some of the inserts as well. So we'll get to that in a second. Now series two was done in a very different way. Like I said, it was not done with parallels, but the first subset that they did was for the expansion teams and this was the first year of the toronto raptors and the vancouver grizzlies so they did a little set of each of the teams and they also included the the first round draft picks for both teams so that means damon stoudemire and big country reeves both have cards in this subset the cards look great this was a subset that most of the, the companies were able to get really well but this was easily one of the best of the subsets for these teams of course the colors of the teams also help now for the rookies themselves, they had a whole subset where every single player had a really, really good portrait-like shot, action shot of the player right dead center in the card. And then the whole background is ghosted with the text rookie right across, filling up the entire space. And the, the text is all done in the color of the team. So that means that each one of these cards stands really well. It's bold, it's strong, the player reads beautifully in it. And this becomes one of the best rookie cards for, for these players. And this was a good rookie class too. So this is a good year for these rookies to really stand on their own. 
The only other subset that they did was their encore set, and this was a couple players for each team. It's it, it's a decent enough subset, but it's kind of thrown there at the end. But still, Series 2 was really well done. But like I said, this was all about the inserts. That, that was what FLIR was all about, and so they did a lot of inserts, and we start off with All-NBA. Now, All-NBA, again, this is first, second, and third teams. They, they love doing that, so it's 15 cards. These cards are much better designed. They have a theme in the background of kind of like, I don't know if it's, it's pouring metal or if it's like cut up metal or torn up metal. I'm not sure what they went with, but the first team is done with gold metal. Second team is done with silver metal. And the third team is done with bronze metal. And all of these cards do come with medallions. Now the way that the gold medallions work for the inserts is instead of the whole card being covered, they take just the logo and they turn that into a solid disc of gold foil with the same gold medallion insignia that you saw on the main cards that was embossed in the main cards. So that's the way that these cards are different. They're not different in any other way. It's just that little logo. And then of course they did their all rookie team. And this is kind of a, a weird affair where they, I think they were doing kind of a celestial theme, kind of like planets orbiting something. I think that's what they were going with, although it was basketballs. So it was kind of a messed up, a messed up theme that they went with, but I mean, it looks kind of cool. Unfortunately, all the gold foil for the text can't be read can't be read on this card, but it's still kind of a cool idea that they came up with. And these were also cards that had gold medallion versions. Then you have the all rookie set, and these are these are really impressive rookie cards. This is just ten of the rookies, but each one of these cards is again a really good shot of the player. But the the color around the the player uh, of the whole card back it reads beautifully. So this is another one of those great rookie cards. This is easily a front runner for best rookie card for each of these players this year. And this card did not have a gold medallion parallel. Now, the, all, the double trouble cards were a lot better than the previous year. Not that that was hard. Here, they still had the two images, but they did more of a superimposition of one image over the other. And the back image is basically colored for, for a solid, an almost solid color on the card back, which made the card read really well. These were gold medallion cards. And then they have the Fabulous 50s, and these were horizontal cards. Now this is kind of a mess of a card, but you'll notice that the all of the foil on this is actually silver. It's not gold, it's actually silver. And so the, the gold medallion version of the card is, has silver for the, the medallion. It's called gold medallion, but it it is in silver. So that's the way that it's supposed to be, just so that you know. Then we have Jam City, and this Jam City card is, I'm not sure if it's better or worse, because I still, I still don't know how to take the previous year. But here they did a very light brush metal approach for a, a solid foil card back behind the player. It's kind of overpowering. It does have kind of a neat effect to it. But this is a distinct card to talk about because they did not have the gold medallion parallel for this card. Instead, they had what's called a hot pack. And if you're not familiar with what a hot pack is, hot packs were an individual pack that was randomly assorted into boxes. I think it was about one in 280. At any rate, you open up the pack and instead of having a whole bunch of different cards, it has one complete set of this insert card set. All 10 cards and every single card is the same as the normal release of the card, except they have a little hot pack logo on it. Just a little red foil logo down at the bottom. And that is the way that these cards came in, in packs. That's how they were released. So instead of getting multiple cards, you literally got just one set. And the, the main cards were, in this case, it was probably about 1 in 36, which means one out of every 10 boxes. So in order to get the set, you would have to get at least 10 boxes if you got no doubles in order to get them all. That's 360 packs. Whereas the hot packs were one out of every 280 packs has a complete set. So the, the hot pack cards are a lot more common than the, the regular cards, but the regular cards, are you're gonna run into them a lot more frequently. So that's kind of the way that it works. The hot pack cards are more common, so they're a little bit less valuable, but you don't see them as often. And again, they did Ultra Power. And again, it's a big explosion of color. This time it's basically, it's exactly that, a huge explosion of color. It's pretty cool, different colors, but they didn't get sparkly and try to do any tricks like that. Then you have Rising Stars and Rising Stars is a solid foil card and kind of like Scoring Kings in the previous year where they had different color foils. They did that here in this card, but this is done more like the, the 94, 95 flare center spotlight cards. And it's, I wasn't a fan of those cards. I'm not a fan of these cards. They do have the gold medallion version. And then we do Scoring Kings here. And for 95, 96, the Scoring King cards, they, they have kind of a medieval theme and they have a, a toned down foil with, with some brighter elements that pop up. 
it's um, it, you know, it's an interesting card. It's, it is kind of neat. And they again did this with the hot packs. So this is like the Jam City. These are hot pack parallels. They are not paralleled with the gold medallion. They also, Fleer did a whole set of Jerry Stackhouse scrapbook cards. And these were sections of this little scrapbook set that came in different releases. So Fleer had it, Flair had it, Ultra had it. And these were what the cards looked like for Ultra. Now it all rounds out with the Team USA cards. And this was, again, just like with Stackhouse, there's no parallel for these cards. It's just 10 cards, so it's the initial run of all of the players for the 96 Dream Team. And these cards are, they're really kind of nice. I mean, there's nothing that stands out about them. They, they don't, you're not going to notice them at any point, but they do look nice regardless. But that kind of, that rounded out the, the second set. So that's what these sets were all about. They were all about the inserts. And there were a lot of parallels in 95, 96, which made it a lot more fun. And the card design was a lot better, basically across the board. There were a few really good designs in 94, 95, but not very much. Now for 96, 97, they would make a whole nother run of, they would come up with a whole new concept. And so that whole path is another one to talk about that I'll talk about it at a different time. But this is basically the mid years of Ultra. This was, this was when they were kind of figuring out how to, how to go from an early 90s to a late 90s card set. And it's kind of interesting to see what they did. So I hope you learned some things. Definitely leave some comments below if, if you've got some perspective on it, you're, you've got, you, you like these cards or not, you know, let me know. And subscribe if you haven't done so already. Check out my other videos. And thank you very much for watching.